shall we? Starting us off at number 10 is the Judas Cradle. The medieval times are known for a lot of stuff, and one of those is their insanely gruesome torture devices. Back then, if you'd found out you were facing the guillotine, you could actually breathe a sigh of relief, because trust me, there were far worse ways to die. One of these horrific devices was called a Judas Cradle, and was used to interrogate prospective criminals into talking, and often would result in their death one way or another. Victims that faced this torture would be stripped of their clothing, bound, and then lowered slowly onto a pyramid shaped spike that, depending on your downstairs parts, would be aimed at different areas, I'll just say. Any movement at all would only make the pain worse, so if you weren't telling them what they wanted to hear, they would often rock the victim back and forth, tearing them further open, and they would keep victims here as long as it took, sometimes even overnight. But what about the death part? Well, if you didn't die from injuries received during the torture, or frankly just blood loss, then most died from infection. You see, the spike was never really cleaned, so there was a whole horde of bacteria and disease that would settle onto the spike, inevitably seeping into the victim's nether regions. Ah, how fun, right? <laughs> Next up at number 9 is cruentation. The Middle Ages had many interesting ways to handle justice, much of which I think we are all incredibly grateful is illegal nowadays. One of these such practices was called cruentation. Essentially back then, they believed that corpses retained a tiny spark of life after death, and so they were therefore revered as magical entities. Just imagining that they saw rigor mortis and decided that the corpse was somehow still alive. But how did this involve their judicial system? Well, with the idea of using the corpse's magical powers to their advantage, they would place an accused killer in contact with the corpse of their alleged victim. And if the corpse started spontaneously bleeding when the convict was in its presence, it was seen as confirmed evidence that they were guilty of the crime. This actually remained a completely legal practice until the late 17th century. But thankfully, somewhere down the line, they figured out that maybe a dead, bleeding body couldn't be used as proof to convict someone of killing. Next up at number 8 is slug soup. Listen, I love just about all the creatures on the planet, and I don't have it out for slugs or anything, but I have never been able to look at one without feeling nauseous, so this actually sounds like a personal version of hell to me. During the crusade battles, Muslims became popular for using aconite to poison the crusaders. This was obviously causing quite an issue, as at the time there was no known cure. That was until one day, when 14th century doctor Guido de Vigavano noticed some slugs munching away on an aconite leaf, and he had the biggest light bulb moment of his career. He collected slugs and boiled them before using the boiled sludge and turning it into a soup. First, he tested it on animals, and after successful results there, he decided to try it out for himself. After a bit of trial and error, it turned out to make quite a successful antidote to the poison. But Man oh man, does it sound incredibly disgusting, but still better than being poisoned, I guess. <laughs> Coming in at number 7 are transy tombs. In the Middle Ages, the practice of memento mori, meaning remember you must die, was huge. Memento mori was practiced in many ways, open caskets, churches filled with skeletons of the dead, and years later developed into things like photographing the dead. Their keen attachment to this philosophy likely stemmed from the sheer amount of people dying so frequently due to the overall lack of hygiene, so they had to come to terms with death in a much more peaceful sense than maybe we do now. One of their favorite ways to practice memento mori, however, was with transy tombs, which were funerary monuments that depicted the deceased in a stage of eerie decomposition. As you can imagine, they were costly, so usually they could only be resurrected after those with high standing or a small fortune in the bank. At the time, there was an existing belief that the earthly body was merely a transition vessel of the soul, and that after death, the spirit would be be resurrected. And so in creating these tombs that resembled the decomposing dead, they figured it would help the soul move on more quickly. And while I'm not opposed to all of the reasons behind it, from the modern lens, it is a bit morbid to have statues not only resembling the dead, but looking like zombies lining the streets, and I'm just glad this practice went out of fashion. Coming
Coming in at number six is bloodletting. Back in the day, the medical practice of bloodletting was used by medieval physicians as they believed it would literally let the bad blood out of the body. This belief is mostly derived from the Greek physician Hippocrates and his theory of the four humors. The four humoral theory centered around the belief that inside the body there are four main humors or liquids. Black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. And that any imbalance in these liquids was what caused health issues or even changes in temperament. So where bloodletting came in was that there was this belief you could let out blood in order to balance out these liquids in your body again. Now while this theory was definitely a stepping stone in modern medicine, many argue could be considered a precursor to blood transfusions, the way that it was being done was without any real scientific backing and without any understanding of just how much blood was safe to let out or from what vein or artery was the safest. For example, people were so into the practice at the time that they would base which day was best for bloodletting on texts, usually advising to pick a saint's day. It was also popular to rely on charts showing which parts of the body were best to bleed from according to their zodiac. So as you can imagine, the practice did not always end well. Coming in at number five is Saint Francesca Romana. During medieval times, fornication in any other context than between a man and his wife and for the purposes of procreation was considered a sin punishable by life in prison. Now of course there were many many people that did not take this to heart, but there was one woman who very much did, Francesca Romana. For as long as Romana could recall, she always wanted to become a nun when she got older, but as happened all too frequently back then, her father forced her into marriage at the age of 13 as the man in question was extremely wealthy. At first she was incredibly reluctant, but after she allegedly received a vision from Saint Alexis, she changed her tune and became a dutiful wife. And even perhaps grew to like her husband. But this didn't change Romana's belief about the sins revolving what went on in the marital bed. So in private, wishing to remain spiritually chaste even if she couldn't be in her physical body, she would heat pork fat and burn her nether regions to ensure that she would remain in extreme pain throughout the act and never enjoy a minute of it. This was the only way she believed she could commit the act without sin and remain in the good graces with God. <sighs> Coming in at number four is an arthritis cure. This one actually blew my mind when I first came across it. According to an 1896 news story in the Smithsonian, one day a drunk man was on a beach with some of his friends when he spotted a rotting whale carcass. Because he was drunk, he thought it'd be super funny to dive right into it, and he did. His friends waited for him and finally he came out, but he reported something incredibly strange, that his rheumatoid arthritis was seemingly gone. This sparked a national craze in Australia and once word got out about the healing powers of the whale carcass, the town of Eden became a worldwide destination for people suffering from the condition. Visitors would be lowered into a freshly dead whale through a hole which would be sewn up and it was advertised that if the person could stay inside for 20 to 30 hours, they would be cured of their pain. I have to imagine that you would need to be in so much pain to give this a try in the first place because the thought of spending an entire day inside of a dead whale just seems wild. That being said, it's not all a bunch of hogwash. There is reason to believe that the rotting whale would have acted like a sweat box of sorts, potentially relieving some of the pain. But truthfully, I don't see how this could cause any kind of permanent fix. Let's just be grateful there are some other options out there today. Coming in at number three is a brutal execution. As has already been established, one of medieval Europe's most notorious strengths was figuring out the most gruesome way to either torture or kill their citizens. And if you thought that the Judas Cradle was bad, then wait until you hear about this one. To be hanged, drawn, and quartered was a method of execution far worse than any other. At least with practices like the guillotine, it's over quickly enough, but with this one it was quite literally drawn out just to make you suffer. First off, the victim would be tied to a wooden panel and dragged, or drawn, behind a horse to their place of execution. Second, they would be hanged until the point right before they died, then they would 
emasculate the body often by disembowelment or emasculating it while they were still alive before finally beheading them and quartering the body, meaning cutting it into four pieces. It was intentionally excessive as this was a punishment saved for those who committed high treason against the king and was used to instill compliance and fear in the onlookers. It was most popular in 14th century England, although it remained in the rotation of choices until it was abolished in 1870. Coming in at number two are changelings. Across Europe, there was an old belief in changelings, which were thought to be evil creatures left in place of young ones stolen by fairies. This was a huge problem for many reasons. Number one, it was objectively not happening. You see, the main reason that parents believed their little ones had been swapped with a changeling was that their young ones suddenly fell ill, had physical deformities, behavioral changes like advanced knowledge beyond their years, or being mischievous. So essentially, if the young person in question got sick, became intelligent, had a disability, or acted like a normal developing person in any way, it was viewed as a changeling. Tragically, once it was believed that a changeling imposter was in their arms, there was only one way to handle the situation. Hurt it in hopes that the fairies would come save the changeling and they would give their real one back. They did things like exorcisms, leaving them in the cold, poisoning them, or even trying to end their lives. And they believed that in doing this, their real little one would be returned to them. It may just be one of the saddest and most cruel practices to have ever existed. And last up in our number one spot are Ivy League photos. If you thought there was corruption in the high ranking areas of society before this, then buckle up cause this one might be one of the most insane things I've ever heard. Apparently for some time it was actually required for students enrolling in Ivy League schools to have their photos taken in a grotesquely inappropriate fashion. To put it delicately, you are not allowed to be dressed. This dark underbelly came to light in the 1970s when a Yale employee opened a long locked room and discovered thousands of photos dating back several decades. It was then uncovered that between the 40s to the 60s, it was a requirement to submit what they called posture photos, which were taken from every single angle and forced the subjects to attach pins to their spines under the guise of studying their spines. Some schools, however, practiced longer. Harvard, for example, began in the 1880s and got away with it until the 20th century. Of course, there was a huge investigation about this, and they found that the photos were used in various studies studies for big tobacco or that they would use them in books for illustrations, but the creepiest was a professor that admitted the photos were used for anthropological research and were used to study the connection between a student's body type and their intelligence in what was basically glorified eugenics. Thankfully, most of these photos have since been burned, however, for some reason there are some that remain at the Smithsonian. I'm just grateful the practice of mandatory nude photos is banned because actually what the, what the heck is that? Number 10. Carbon dioxide went down due to so many deaths. Genghis Khan was a founder and first Kaugan of the Mongol Empire, which later became the largest adjoining land empire in history. Having spent the majority of his life uniting the Mongol tribes, he launched a series of military campaigns which conquered large parts of China and Central Asia. In the 13th century, he ended the lives of so many peasants that the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were significantly reduced as a result. During his 21 year reign, his destructive armies were responsible for the deaths of up to 40 million people. With so many people gone and nobody left to farm the lands owned by the peasants, nature went back to its true form and grew back into carbon absorbing forests. It's estimated that 700 tons of carbon were wiped from the atmosphere, which to put in perspective is around the same amount of carbon dioxide generated in a year through global gasoline consumption. Now, before we continue on, I have a question for all of you watching. Do you ever get tired of those same old boring games from the app store? Well, look no further, because I have just the game for you. It's called Raid Shadow Legends, and it's honestly the best. It's completely free to download, and there's already millions of users. It has amazing graphics, and there's billions of ways to customize and build your champions, as there's endless content. 
Now I'm sure you've all heard the hypothetical question, which four historical people would you invite to a dinner party? Well if I could choose four characters from Raid to have dinner with, I'd choose Aethel, Sniper, Archer, and Fireblade. They are four strong female characters who are tough and I'd love to get some battle tips from them. Plus they have awesome names. And if Sniper could teach me how to use her bow and arrow, that would be pretty cool in my opinion. Who would you bring? Let me know in the comments down below. But that's not all. Raid's fourth anniversary is here and there's a ton to get excited about. I'm talking dedicated offers, gifts, promo codes, events, and a brand new fusion event where you guys can get your hands on the anniversary themed legendary champion. But wait. There's more. With all this exciting stuff and more coming to Raid, if you haven't started playing yet, then what are you waiting for? For new users only, you can use our link in the description or scan our QR code to get insane bonuses. We're talking an epic champion Kellen the Strike and other useful things. And since it's Raid's birthday, the gifts keep coming. All new and existing players can get a bunch of free birthday gifts. Once you're in game after clicking the links, just enter promo code 4 years Raid to get your hands on 4 legendary skill tomes plus other useful stuff. Simple. So make sure to download Raid Shadow Legends and let's get on with the video. Number 9. Dentures were made from the dead. Dentures were a pretty big deal among the upper classes in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Typically high sugar diets combined with early attempts at teeth whitening, which wore away tooth enamel instead of brightening it, meant that their teeth were bad. So people would get dentures. but how did they make dentures back then? The easiest and most profitable way to acquire human teeth for dentures was to take them from the dead. Yep, they would take dead people's teeth and use them as their own teeth. The battlefield at Waterloo presented thousands of recently dead soldiers whose teeth were unfortunately perfect for taking. I mean reduce, reuse, recycle right? But I think I'd rather have no teeth than have dentures made of someone else's teeth. Number 8. Human Zoos Yes, you heard that right. There were zoos and instead of animals, which some people are already against, they were filled with people. Like human beings of all genders and ages. Human zoos were public displays of people, usually in so called natural or primitive states. They were most prominent during the 19th and 20th centuries, and in the 1870s, exhibitions of so called exotic populations became popular throughout the Western world. Human zoos could be seen in many of Europe's largest cities, such as Paris, Hamburg, London, Milan, as well as American cities such as New York City and Chicago. They began as part of circuses and freak shows, and in the the Western Hemisphere, one of the earliest known zoos, that in Mexico, consisted not only of a vast collection of animals, but also dwarves, albinos, and hunchbacks. This wasn't all though, as the dissection and display of bodies after their death without consent was also shown. Throughout their existence, such exhibitions garnered controversy over their demeaning, derogatory, and dehumanizing nature. Thankfully, the last human zoo on record was at the World's Fair in Brussels in 1958, which isn't even that long ago. Go, which is insane to me. Number 7. Magdalene Asylums I hope I'm saying that right. Magdalene Asylums, also known as Magdalene Laundries, were Roman Catholic institutions that operated from the 18th to the late 20th centuries to house fallen women. The term referred to female sexual promiscuity or work in prostitution, young women who became pregnant outside of marriage, or young girls and teenagers who did not have familial support. They were required to work without pay apart from food provisions. Many of these laundries were effectively operated as penitentiary workhouses. The strict regimes in the institutions were often more severe than those found in prisons. Now this contradicted the perceived outlook that they were meant to help women as opposed to punishing them, but let's be honest, they were just punishing them. These places operated in the United Kingdom, Ireland, Sweden, Canada, and the United States, and Australia for much of the 19th and well into the 20th century, with the last one closing in 1996, which isn't that long ago. A survivor said the working conditions, the heat was unbelievable, you couldn't leave your station unless a bell went. Now that definitely sounds more like a punishment and I don't understand how this could happen. Number
Number 6. The Schoolhouse Blizzard The Schoolhouse Blizzard hit the US Plain States on January 12th, 1888. The blizzard came unexpectedly on a relatively warm day, and most people were not dressed properly. Many people went out without coats and even short sleeved shirts. What made the storm so deadly was the timing, as it was during work and school hours. The very strong wind fields behind the cold front and the powdery snow reduced visibilities on the open plains to zero, which is terrifying. People ventured from the safety of their homes to do chores, go to town, attend school, or simply enjoy the warm day. The weather changed so fast though, and people weren't prepared for it, and as a result, thousands of people got caught in the blizzard. They got lost in the darkness, and the snow, and the wind, and many froze in their town, just yards away from houses or other sources of refuge. The death toll was 235, though some estimate 1,000. Now I know I complain about Canadian winter and snowstorms, but this is definitely worse. Number 5. Human Remains in Medicine Human remains were a common ingredient in medicine until the 20th century, which again is disgusting to me. The remains were most commonly ground up into fine powder that could be made into pills or stirred into drinks. People thought that ingesting a certain part of the body would help cure illnesses in that part of their own. For example, crushed skull powder was believed to cure headaches. Now I am so glad that our science has advanced past that because I cannot imagine ingesting something from another human. Now due to this, mummy remains were particularly valued as remedies. In fact, there are so few mummies these days precisely because of this high demand for human flesh at the time. Ew. <laughs> Number 4. The AIDS Epidemic The AIDS epidemic caused by HIV found its way to the United States between the 1970s and 1980s. During the HIV slash AIDS epidemic of the 1880s, LGBTQ communities were further stigmatized as they became the focus of mass hysteria, suffered isolation and marginalization, and were targeted with extreme acts of violence in the United States. One of the best known works on the history of HIV and AIDS is the 1987 book and the band played on by Randy Schultz who claimed that Ronald Reagan's administration dragged its feet in dealing with the crisis due to homophobia, while the gay community viewed early reports and public health measures with corresponding distrust, thus allowing the disease to spread further and infect hundreds of thousands more. US leaders had remained largely silent and unresponsive to the health emergency, and it wasn't until September 1985, four years after the crisis began, that President Ronald Reagan first publicly mentioned AIDS. If Reagan took steps four years earlier, earlier to help and wasn't so homophobic, many, many, many lives would have been saved, but he ignored it. As of 2018, 700,000 people have died of HIV slash AIDS in the United States since the beginning of the epidemic, and nearly 13,000 people with AIDS in the United States die each year. Number 3. Residential schools. Now, many people think that Canada is all sunshine and rainbows, but we actually have our own dark past. In Canada, the Indian residential school system was a network of boarding schools for indigenous peoples. The network was funded by the Canadian government's Department of Indian Affairs and administrated by Christian churches. The school system was created to isolate indigenous children from the influence of their own culture and religion in order to assimilate them into the dominant Canadian culture. Over the course of the system's more than 100 years existence, around 150,000 children were placed in residential schools nationally. The residential school system harmed indigenous children significantly by removing them from their families, depriving them of their ancestral languages, and mistreating them both physically and mentally. Conditions in the schools led to student malnutrition, starvation, and disease. The legacy of the system has been linked to an increased prevalence of post-traumatic stress, alcoholism, use of illegal substances, and generational trauma trauma in indigenous peoples. The number of school related deaths remains unknown due to incomplete records, but estimates range from 3,000 to 200 to over 30,000, and there are thousands of unmarked graves of the poor students. Number 2. Mountain Peel In the late 1890s and early 1900s, St. Pierre Marnique was known as a beautiful town, but there was darkness looming over it, a volcano. Citizens of the area were so used to the volcanic activity that no one took it seriously when the fresh steaming vent holes and earth tremors started during April 1902. Then minor explosions began at the summit of the volcano, ash began to rain down continuously, and the nauseating stench of sulfur filled the air. Even worse, more than a hundred snakes slithered down and invaded the town. Yeah. 
snakes. And they ended the lives of 50 people. Then on May 5th, a landslide of boiling mud and water from the Etang Sec Crater Lake spilled into the River Blanche and 23 workmen died. This was followed by a tsunami that ended the lives of hundreds of people. This naturally caused concern in the town and many wanted to leave. I'm sorry, but people stayed through all of that and decided to stay, even after the whole snake situation. Then. Three days later, May 8th, Mount Healy finally exploded, sending an avalanche of white hot lava straight towards the town. Within three minutes, St. Pierre was completely destroyed, and of its 30,000 population, there were only two people who survived. And coming in at number one is the Dancing Plague. In 1518, the city of Strasbourg was hit by a dancing plague where people would dance uncontrollably for days at a time. It began with a single woman dancing solo for a few days before eventually more more and more people became affected. Doctors proclaimed that the illness was caused by overheated blood and recommended that the inflicted should continue to shimmy and sway the fever away. I mean, musicians were even called in and a stage was set up in the town center to give the dancers more room. While the idea may seem funny at first, most of them kept dancing till they fell unconscious and some died from exhaustion, heart attack, or stroke. Starting off this countdown, we have the sarcophagus. Basically, this is a massive steel and concrete concrete structure that covers the Chernobyl power plant. It was designed to help contain the radiation. The construction of the structure lasted for 206 days, and those working on it had to work in shifts of no more than 7 minutes. Any more time spent near the reactors would have killed them. But still, they did sacrifice their lives building this because thousands of workers still died from exposure to the radiation. Those that survived got severely ill, and majority of them developed cancer. Nowadays, the sarcophagus is still there, but it's beginning to crumble. In 2019, they were in the process of dismantling it because it was going to collapse. So a new one is currently being installed. That's probably the scariest thing in Chernobyl because of how deadly the building it's containing is. Coming in at number 9, we have the gas masks. And if you guys are liking this video or want to see part 3, then smash that like button. Chernobyl already looks like the place where an apocalypse occurred. Buildings are completely abandoned, run down, and overgrown with nature. What doesn't help is the piles upon piles of gas masks scattered all throughout Chernobyl. This really adds to the eeriness of this place. And again, makes it look like a place where a zombie or alien takeover occurred. In fact, there is one room inside a school which is just completely filled with child size gas masks. It's very creepy, but also sad. Like imagine how frightened the young children were when this happened. The gas masks found there are just a sad reminder of the horrors that took place there when the reactor exploded. Moving on to number 8, we have the rotting toys. Littered all throughout the city are toys or personal belongings people had to leave behind. The saddest thing to see are pictures of children's toys left behind. Like, I just think that was probably someone's favorite little dolly. Go anywhere there and you'll find items scattered everywhere, now broken and covered in filth. Like imagine, you're rushed out of your home and have to leave behind all your personal belongings. That must have been so hard. I can't imagine how everyone must have felt. It's really depressing to think about. Moving on at number 7, we have the examination chair. So uh, this one is pretty strange, but somehow a gynecologist examination chair ended up in the middle of the woods outside of a hospital. Not only is that super weird, but it's also super creepy. It's all rusted and beat up and looks like an old torture device. Not only that, but that means someone had to go inside the abandoned hospital, find that chair, and then carry it all the way back down and into the woods. I got a lot of questions. Why would someone do this? And how long did it take them to do this? And again, why would someone do this? Either way, it makes for a very spooky encounter. Moving on at number 6, we have the abandoned cooling tower. A partially constructed cooling tower can be found at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. They were built to evaporate the cooling water from the two new reactors. Sadly, they were never completed. Now, these things are massive. The diameter was over 120 meters, and it stands at 150 meters tall. Obviously, after the accident, there was no need to continue on with the construction of this, so the government just left the towers there along with everything else. Eventually, over time, nature will have its way with it, and it will start to erode and crumble. It's just 
crazy seeing all these abandoned infrastructures. Imagine how life would have been if that explosion never happened. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the toxic river. There is a river that is just filled with radioactive water right near the reactor. The scariest part is despite how toxic the water is, a bunch of aquatic life live there. In particular, giant catfish. Yes, giant catfish. A video from 2016 shows a massive catfish swimming in the water. People originally were like, oh my god, what the heck is that? It must be some sort of mutated animal. Later, it was just found out to be a giant catfish. But still, what the heck? And it's the fact that they have adapted to be able to survive in that highly toxic water. Like, that just baffles me. Not only that, but they can thrive there because the water has no higher predators. Obviously, though, you're not allowed to go fishing there. Okay, I feel like that's a given, but I also feel like people would still try it, so I'm just gonna say it. Don't go fishing there. In our fourth spot, we have the jarfish. Speaking of fish, we're gonna go with this. So back in 2016, photographer and journalist Miriam Wazer took a trip to explore the ruins of Chernobyl. While inside an abandoned building, she came across something very creepy and odd. She found a bunch of fish and other specimen in jars. Why someone was collecting fish, it just baffles many. And they weren't even like proper beakers or science mason jars. No, no, it looked like someone emptied out their jar of pickles and then used it to store the specimen. I think it's best if those remain untouched. Like, can you imagine how stinky they would be if they were open nowadays? They would reek. Old stinky fish is not something I would ever want to handle. Now the other specimen beside the fish are unknown. No one knows what the heck they are. But if you know, let me know in the comments below. Coming in at number 3 we have the abandoned hospitals. The hospitals at Chernobyl are quite eerie. They are just filled with rusted, empty hospital beds, littered syringes and more. The walls and floors are cracking and there is dirt and questionable red marks on the floor. I think the saddest thing though is that these hospitals are often trashed with medical supplies just tossed everywhere. The days after the explosion happened, people were frantically rushing to hospitals. Hospital staff were overwhelmed by the amount of people there. This moment is still preserved in the hospitals to this day. It's pretty dark once you think about it. And at number 2 today we have the Sad Alley. The Sad Alley or the Alley of Memory is an alley in the Ukraine created in memory of the villages and residents who had to flee from their homes during the disaster. Basically it's a walkway with signs lining the sides. These signs are names of cities and villages that had to evacuate and leave everything behind. It's a way to ensure we just never forget the impact that this disaster had. It's really sad. And in our number one spot today we have the radioactive spiders. Yes, you heard me correctly. Imagine if Peter Parker got bit by one of these bad guys. He'd be like a weirdly mutated Spider-Man or something like that. But anyways, the spiders in the exclusion zone are radioactive. So you definitely don't want to be bit by one. Oh wait, it gets worse. They also make radioactive webs. Yeah, you heard me, that's a thing. So you don't have to just worry about these spiders, but you have to worry about walking through their deadly webs. Like what the heck? No thank you, nah, -uh. I'm not a fan of spiders, but imagine radioactive ones. That sounds like it belongs in a horror movie. Radioactive, radioactive. In our number 10 spot we have the mosquito experiment. This experiment is truly the most surprising one to me on this list. I cannot believe how many people don't know about this. Apparently in 1956 and 1957 the US Army conducted a series of experiments on Georgia, Florida and Savannah where millions of infected mosquitoes were released into the public in order to see if insects could spread yellow fever. The result? Well, they learned that indeed they can. Of course at the expense of the American people's health as many died, many developed fevers, respiratory problems, stillbirths and so much more. Allegedly, researchers posed as public health workers and asked people if they needed help in order to get close to them and observe them. Pretty evil in my opinion and makes you wonder and hope that nothing like that is happening to us right now but possibly at this moment in time we are not aware of it. If you are liking this video so far, don't forget to smash that like button as it will really help us out. In our number 9 spot we have the Black Death. 
The Black Death is definitely one of the craziest events in history that is definitely taught about in some schools, but as this was so long ago, it's not as frequently spoken about like World War 1 and 2 for example. It is also known by its other labels, the Great Plague or the Black Plague. And as you can tell by the title, it was a horrible widespread pandemic that killed from 75 to 200 million people. They say at least half of Europe at the time. It took place in 1346 to 1353. As you can imagine, such a plague during a time where no one could stay indoors and communicate online, there was mass chaos everywhere. People blamed religion, witchcraft, and anything they could blame. There is a very famous painting by the name of The Triumph of Death by Peter Bruegel that is supposed to be depicting the chaos of that time. There is so much death and things on fire, the painting is truly haunting to look at. In our number 8 spot, we have government testing. In 1954, the US government performed a series of nuclear tests in the Pacific Ocean called Castle Bravo, and the explosion occurred a little too close to the Marshall Islands, and it heavily impacted the people there. The Marshallese people had radiation poisoning, beta burns, and of course, as you can imagine, many developed cancer. After this event, the US created a new project called Project 4.1, where they examined and studied the after effects of the explosion on the Marshallese people, and many wondered, was the explosion perhaps on purpose so that the US could study the effects on these people? Now that would be a truly horrific thing if proven to be true, not that anyone would ever be able to find that out. But regardless, why don't more people know about this very serious event in history? I bet you the Marshallese people are still dealing with after effects. In our number 7 spot we have the Nanking Massacre. The Nanking Massacre took place in 1937 to 1938 and even though it was only one year, a significant amount of damage was done. This was a time when the Japanese Imperial Army invaded Nanjing, China and a series of killings and many other brutal forms of torture took place. It has been estimated that over 300,000 died and the women were ordered to do unspeakable things to their offspring. It's quite horrific so I cannot go into detail otherwise YouTube will censor the video but it's wild to me that not many know about this horrible event in history. In our number 6 spot we have the Great Leap Forward. In Canada, we are taught a little bit about world history and then our own Canadian history. But I was never taught about this catastrophe, so I thought I would include it in this list. If you were taught this, then that's good because this is definitely an event that everyone needs to know about. Between 1958 to 1962, a policy was put in place implemented by Mao Zedong, who was the chairman of the Communist Party in China, and this policy led to the death of up to 45 million people. How was this policy even implemented? Well, under the disguise of distributing the wealth and making everyone equal as a sort of utopian paradise so that their country could surpass their competitors. But this quickly turned into people not being given food, which led to a projected 25 million dying of starvation, and when incentives to work were removed, violence was used to motivate people. Oh, and did I mention that food was only given to those that followed the party's every order? Pretty horrific and crazy to think that my mom and dad were alive when this happened. It was not that long ago. In our number 5 spot we have the Taiping Rebellion. The Taiping Rebellion, also known as the Taiping Civil War in 1850, was a massive civil war that took place in China. The French, British and American mercenaries were all involved. The country had suffered some major disasters, natural and economic, before the rebellion began, so as you can imagine they were quite vulnerable. Also, apparently the Europeans brought an opium addiction to China. At the time, the Qing Dynasty ruled China and during this period, in comes a man named Hong Zekuang who claimed to be the younger brother of Jesus Christ. This war lasted till August of 1871. It is known as one of the bloodiest civil wars in history, killing 20 million people. In our number 4 spot, we have two heads. This is one of the most evil things on this list and for anyone that likes dogs, this one may break your heart. This was a Russian scientist in the 50s by the name of Vladimir Demikhov and he ended up being the founder of of human organ transplants, which arguably is one of the greatest discoveries in the last 100 years. The amount of lives this discovery has saved is probably unfathomable. So to think that before this discovery, the same doctor was performing head transplants on dogs for fun for five years is just so hard to believe. In our number three spot, we have amusement park deaths. A lot of people don't realize this, but many amusement parks around the world have had tragedies. Ironically, because these are places you would hope to go to to feel joy, not sadness. Lake Shawnee Amusement Park is one example.
example of a park that experienced one too many tragedies. The park was located in West Virginia from 1926 to 1966 and it had quite a few deaths on its hands while it was active. People believe that the land was cursed though because before the park opened in 1783, many young European settlers were killed on the grounds by the natives in that area because the grounds were already a sacred burial area for them before the new settlers took over the land. People believe that all of the bloodshed left a mark on the energy of the area and that is why the park never had a chance. In our number 2 spot we have the Soviet deaths. Here we have yet another event where the government has put policies into place under the cause of making the country more economically and socially competitive, but yet the people suffer tremendously because of it. From 1917 to 1953 under the Soviet Union, approximately 49 million Russians died from a combination of revolution, starvation and the forced resettlement, similar to the Great Leap Forward policy. Apparently this initiative was due to one man, Joseph Stalin. It has been said that this desire to build a new and better country at any cost and to keep his power is the direct reason for all of these deaths. In our number one spot we have the Mongolian conquests. This is something people certainly know a little bit about, but perhaps not the extent of it. Certainly those of us in North America are not taught much, but that's probably because it didn't take place here and there's just so much history to learn. The Mongol Empire was one of the largest in the world, covering 16% of the earth at one point. It was run by Genghis Khan, a man who is said to have more blood on his hands than anyone in history. Approximately 60 million died under his ruling and also many women were severely harmed during this time by the men and it is said that Genghis Khan alone may have reproduced a ton of children as people say that he had about 500 secondary wives. Yay. Number 10. Poison. Somebody literally poisoned the water hole this time around. The Prohibition era was a time where there were restrictions placed on the consumption of alcohol, which was done so with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, another Asian, you name it. Anything that has to do with alcohol, no go. This was all banned by the US government from 1920 to 1933. It's a it's a long time with our twisted teas. Now, of course, this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming alcohol, obviously. It was just done so in sneakier ways, right? Come in my basement. I got some, I got some, yeah, drink this. I don't know, whatever. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead of what they were getting before, which, I mean, as I said it, I'm like, this doesn't sound nice, does it? I'm not thirsty saying this out loud. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing is not. Something that the government agents did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. It was, uh, they literally poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. Like, that's, yeah. And not just poison in a way where the consumer would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this alone. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. Cut to today, well, more and more things are now legal, so a little different in these 20s. Number nine, the man in the green hat. Congress had their own personal bootlegger. How nice must that have been? He was known as the man in the green hat. His name was George L. Cassidy. This was probably the weirdest job in history. It's, it, it's up there. Cassidy's nine to five was to walk through the halls of Congress, making up to 30 deliveries of illegal booze every single day. All the while, Capitol Police just watched. Yeah, he could come and go at any time. In over five years, he supplied bottles of whiskey, moonshine, scotch, bourbon, gin, you name it. He'd carry all of this in a briefcase. Yeah, so he couldn't have looked more official with his hat and his briefcase. He's going to work. This guy's nine to five. He's busy. His politician friends eventually got him his own room, his own office to work out of in the house office building. In 1925, he was sadly arrested while ferreting six quarts of whiskey to a house member. He had with him that day a light green hat on, and from then on, he's been referred to as the man in the green hat. Yeah, he was busted. He was busted that sad day. Damn. Don't snitch. Somebody definitely snitched on him, eh? They're like green hat. Looks like the Riddler. He's got a Pabst blue ribbon in his briefcase. Get him. Number eight, not an experiment. Okay, hopefully this clears some things up a bit here, but President Herbert Hoover, he never referred to prohibition as a noble experiment. That is a, that's misquoted. That's not the case. That would be an odd thing to experiment, but that's what many believe here. See, growing up, many books and articles on prohibition have quoted President Herbert Hoover describing prohibition as a noble experiment, but even Hoover himself had to get in on this game of broken telephone. Clear some things up a bit. That's a bad quote, especially given the lives lost during this time. Everything's got to be 
not misquoted at all. Hoover himself reminds us, he assures us that he was a supporter of prohibition, but he actually campaigned for it in 1928. Afterwards, he made a statement at the Republican National Convention saying that our country has deliberately undertaken a great social and economic experiment, noble in motive and far-reaching in purpose. That's the quote, end quote, boom. But years later, Hoover said he was misunderstood. He says the phrase, a great social experiment, noble in motive, was distorted into one thing. It was distorted into a noble experiment, which of course was not at all what he said or not at all what it was. So quit spreading those lies, all right? Let's end this 1928 mix up once and for all, a hundred years later. We're like, oh, Sorry. <laughs> Number seven, World War I. When the United States entered World War I in 1917, prohibition hadn't taken off quite yet. It was close, but still a few things to sign. What really turned the tides were experts coming out and arguing that the barley being used to brew beer could actually be made into bread to feed American soldiers. And then from that point on, I mean, it's kind of hard to argue that, right? You're like, well, okay. Fine then. The war actually allowed some individuals to paint America's German brewing industry as a threat. Yeah, that massive industry. They're like, what are these guys doing? Politicians would label Pabst and Miller as treacherous and menacing, saying there's German enemies right here at home. Yeah, German enemies, and they come in six packs. Heads up. Number six, not every state. We see this now being a Canadian, at least I see this. We're seeing certain things become legal all of a sudden. And it's weird, especially when just a few hours south from where I am right now, there are thousands and thousands of people being incarcerated for having something that at the same time is legal or decriminalized up here. You know what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying. It's odd, but we saw this happen in prohibition as well. Many governors at the time refused to throw any money towards enforcing or policing the alcohol ban. Maryland, for example. Okay, Maryland never even enacted an enforcement code in the first place and eventually earned a reputation as the most stubbornly anti anti-prohibition states in the Union. It's not bad, it's pretty cool. New York followed and repealed its measures in 1923 and then slowly but surely it all went away. Therefore, cheers. Nice. That first state was like, you know what? No. <laughs> Number five, Al Capone's brother. Oh man, sometimes siblings can be the exact same. My brother and I we're practically the same person. We love all the same things, same hobbies, same parents, weirdly enough. What a coincidence is that? Al Capone and his brother? Not so close, it seems. A little different. I don't know. On, on paper, historically, they went uh, like this. Al Capone's oldest brother was a prohibition enforcement agent. Yeah, take that in. Al built a criminal empire built on illegal liquor in Chicago in the 1920s, and Vincenzo, the eldest of the six Capone brothers, he had changed his name to Richard Joseph Hart to hide his identity, and after working at the circus for a bit, because why not, Vincenzo settled in Homer, Nebraska in 1922, but eventually he became a special officer, and eventually he was assigned to investigate bootlegging. He's like, oh, do I have to? Come on. After he lost his badge on suspicion of theft, Vincenzo reunited with the Capone family in 1940. He met up with Al again in Miami and started to get in on that family cash, finally. Number four, the boring 20s. When we think of the roaring 20s, we think champagne everywhere, funny music, people dancing like this, good times, whatever. It wasn't always like that, all right? This wasn't the Great Gatsby, this was the 1920s. And according to a study conducted by Boston University economists in the early 1990s, alcohol consumption actually fell by 70% during the early years of prohibition. The levels jumped significantly in the late 20s, sure, but even so, they remained 30% lower than their pre-prohibition levels for years after the 21st Amendment was passed. So it took some time. It took some time for people to, uh, you know, get used to it again, if I can say that. Number three, still going. So I was talking about how some places, some states, they didn't enforce this experiment while others did. Well, again, even today, some are still on board and some are still in the 1920s, it seems. The other, the, the fun 20s. Some states maintained a ban on alcohol within their own borders. Even today, they still do it. Yeah, not a fun place to go. Kansas and Oklahoma remained dry until 1948 and 1959, and Mississippi remained alcohol-free until 1966. That's 33 years after the passing of the 21st Amendment. Like, guy, can we click refresh? There's some, there's some new things going on behind the scenes. I'd love a beverage, please. It's been 33 years. I'm so thirsty. To this day, 10 states still contain counties where alcohol sales are still prohibited. Yeah, go find them and click the no tip option. Be like, here you go. 
Cheers, no receipt for me, I'm good. Number two, new wine. Okay, fine, you wanna ban alcohol? Well, we'll just make it ourselves. We'll use our own feet and stomp on some grapes. I know you do that at some point, so yeah, I'm onto something here. A great amount of low-key small distilleries and breweries continue to operate in secret during prohibition. But if you weren't operating in the shadows, you had to either shut your doors or find new uses for these massive factories. For example, Bush, they refitted their breweries to make ice cream, and Coors, they went down the pottery and ceramics route. Yeah, can I get a tall boy of mint chocolate? Nice, thanks. Tip option for sure on that one. Two scoops, of course. Of course. Now I want chocolate, damn. And finally, number one, grandpa's medicine. Okay, we'll end on this one. The Volstead Act had a few hidden gems in it, okay? You gotta read very closely. There were some exceptions to the ban on distributing alcohol. Like today, we have medicinal purposes for everything. First, of course, right? The same for alcohol. Oh, alcohol helps my anxiety. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sacramental wine was still permitted for religious purposes, and drugstores were allowed to sell medicinal whiskey to treat toothaches and the flu. So you already know, hundreds of people just randomly showed up, lied about their tooth hurting just to get their drink on. One pint of hard liquor every three days. Plan accordingly. There you go, good luck. Pick one movie and then just go, go for it, I guess. Take three ounces every hour until stimulated. Got it, say no more, doc, thank you. Many speakeasies eventually started to disguise themselves as pharmacies. Meanwhile, actual pharmacies were lost in the dust. Some poor fellow's like, no, my tooth actually hurts, bro, but I swear it actually hurts. I'm not like one of those guys, or am I? I'll never tell. Number 10, the wow signal. In 1977, astronomer Jerry Elman was researching at the Ohio State University when an incredible and unexplainable radio signal was detected using the school's big ear telescope. In those days, information was run through what was called an IBM 1130 mainframe computer before being printed on paper and then studied by hand. Upon reviewing the findings, Jerry came across something he had never seen before. There, in a vertical column, was the sequence 6EQUJ5. Jerry was amazed and immediately circled the sequence and wrote wow right beside it. Hence, the name. The signal they picked up had come from nearly 220 million light years away, and there was no explanation as to how or why a radio signal could be detected from that distance. It immediately became a sensation in both the science community and the rest of the world, and was used to support the search for alien life in the universe. Jerry himself says he's convinced that it certainly has the potential to be the first signal from extraterrestrial intelligence, and I agree. Number 9. Einstein's Last Word Albert Einstein was a German-born theoretical physicist, widely acknowledged to be one of the greatest and most influential physicists of all time. Einstein is best known for developing the theory of relativity, but he also made important contributions to the development of theory of quantum mechanics. Einstein passed away at Princeton Hospital, New Jersey on April 18, 1955. He died because of internal bleeding caused by a rupture of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Einstein knew he was going to die as he refused treatment because he didn't believe in prolonging life artificially. There was a nurse present at the time of Einstein's death and she actually heard him mutter something, but she didn't know exactly what it was as she couldn't understand German. Maybe Einstein revealed an incredibly important realization or he just said goodbye to the world in his native language. But guess what? We'll never know and this will be one mystery that can't be solved. Number 8. Genghis Khan Burial Site Genghis Khan was the founder and first Khagan of the Mongol Empire, which later became the largest adjoining land empire in history. Having spent the majority of his life uniting the Mongol tribes, he launched a series of military campaigns which conquered large parts of China and Central Asia. He achieved everything he wanted, but the emperor died during the fall of Yinchuan, which is now part of China. The reasons for his death are unclear, as well as the place he was buried in. Researchers think it might be somewhere in the vicinity of the Mongol sacred mountain of Burkhan Khaldun in current North Northeastern Mongolia. According to legend, he asked to be buried without markings or any sign, and after he died, his body was returned to present day Mongolia. Marco Polo wrote that even by the 13th century, the Mongols did not know the location of the tomb. Another folkloric legend says that a river was diverted over his grave to make it impossible to find. Other tales state that his grave was stamped over by many horses, that trees were planted over the site, and that the permafrost also played its part in the hiding of the burial site. But 
to this day, we still don't know where it is. Number 7. City of Atlantis Writing in the 4th century BC, the Greek philosopher Plato told a story of a land named Atlantis that existed in the Atlantic Ocean and supposedly conquered much of Europe and Africa in prehistoric times. In the story, the prehistoric Athenians strike back against Atlantis in a conflict that ends with Atlantis vanishing beneath the waves. While no serious scholar believes that the story is literally true, they have speculated that the legend could have been inspired in part by real events that happened in Greek history. Many believe that the lost city of Atlantis story was an allegory created by Plato to illustrate the dangers of hubris and greed. In contrast, others point to evidence of ancient cultures in the Mediterranean that could have been connected to Atlantis. This story has captivated people's imaginations for centuries, with theories about its location ranging from a sunken island near the Azores to civilization in Antarctica. Despite extensive research and exploration, the truth behind Atlantis remains unknown and the mystery may never be solved. Whatever the truth, the lost city of Atlantis will likely remain a mystery for generations. Number 6. Jack the Ripper Jack the Ripper was an unidentified serial killer active in and around the Whitechapel district of London, England in the autumn of 1888. Attacks ascribed to Jack the Ripper typically involved a female night worker who lived in and worked in the east end of London. Their throats were cut prior to abdominal mutilations and the removal of internal organs from the last three of the victims led to speculation that Jack had some atomical or surgical knowledge. Rumors that the deaths were connected intensified in September and October 1888 and numerous letters were received by media outlets and Scotland Yard from individuals claiming to be responsible. The From Hell letter received by George Lusk of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee was allegedly sent from Jack the Ripper and it came with a half-preserved human kidney reportedly taken from one of the victims. Now, most of the reports done by the police were destroyed during World War II, but what from remains, we are able to learn that more than 2,000 people were interviewed, upwards of 300 people were investigated, and 80 people were detained. However, there was no conclusion to who the killer was. But to ease your minds, Jack the Ripper has to be dead now, so no worrying about him. Number 5. Tomb of Cleopatra Ancient writers claim that Cleopatra VII and her lover Mark Antony were buried together in a tomb after their deaths in 30 BC. The writer Plutarch wrote that the tomb was located near the Temple of Isis, an ancient Egyptian goddess, and was lofty and beautiful monument containing treasures made of gold, silver, emeralds, pearls, ebony, and ivory. But the location of the tomb remains a mystery. In 2010, Hazay Hawass, Egypt's former antiques minister, conducted excavations at a site near Alexandria which contained a number of tombs dating to the era when Cleopatra ruled Egypt. While many interesting archaeological discoveries were made, Cleopatra VII's tomb was not among them, he reported in a series of news releases. Archaeologists have noted that even if Cleopatra's tomb does survive to this day, it may have been heavily plundered and unidentifiable, so it seems like nobody will be finding that treasure anytime soon. Number 4. The Copper Scroll The Copper Scroll is one of the most mysterious artifacts in history. It was discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1952 and is believed to be around 2,000 years old. The scroll consists of two copper sheets covered with a text written in ancient Hebrew script. It contains a list of 64 items or locations of hidden treasure, including gold and silver coins, sacramental vessels, and other valuable items. The scroll is not only remarkable because of its age, but also because it is the only known ancient text written on metal. This means that it has been preserved much better than other scrolls that have degraded over time. Now, despite its incredible age, many items on the list remain a mystery and their locations have yet to be discovered. There have been many attempts to decipher the copper scroll, but no one has been able to make sense of it. Yet. Yeah. Some experts believe that the scroll could provide valuable information about the history of Jewish people in the region at the time, while others think it's simply a hoax. Whatever the case, the Copper Scroll remains one of history's greatest mysteries. Number 3. Julius Caesar's Son One of the most enduring mysteries of the Roman Empire surrounds the existence of Julius Caesar's son. Some sources claim that he was adopted by Julius Caesar and named Caesarian, while others allege that he was the illegitimate child of the Roman leader and Cleopatra. Regardless of which version of the story is 
authentic, there's no denying that the case of Caesarian has yet to be solved. The only evidence of his existence comes from ancient texts, which refer to him as both as an adopted son of Caesar and an illegitimate child of Cleopatra. However, none of these texts can be verified, leaving its true origin unknown. It's also unclear what became of him after Julius Caesar's assassination in 44 BC, leaving some historians to speculate that he may have had his life ended or gone into hiding. While the mystery of Caesarian may never be solved, it does make for an exciting tale to contemplate. Did he exist? What became of him? Was he ever genuinely recognized as Julius Caesar's son? These questions remain unanswered, but perhaps the truth about Caesarian will come to light one day. Number 2. The Sumerians the Sumer are the earliest known civilization that was located in the historical region of southern Mesopotamia, aka current Iraq. Sumerians were the first to use a written language, they invented a number system, the first wheeled vehicles, sun-dried bricks, and irrigation for farming. But historians are not completely sure where they came from. They had an isolated language, meaning that it was not related to surrounding languages, so that makes it difficult to trace their journey. They suggest that the Sumerians may have come from North Africa, while according to some other data, they might have originated in Caucasus. There are even more theories and it just shows how mysterious the origins of the people who created the first human civilization are. And coming in at number 1 is the Money Pit. The Oak Island Money Pit is a mysterious site on Nova Scotia's Oak Island that has been rumored to contain buried treasure. The legend of the Money Pit dates back to 1795 when three boys discovered a depression on the island and found a layer of flagstones beneath. What began as an innocent exploration quickly became a massive treasure hunt, with hundreds of searchers excavating the island for over 200 years. The money pit has been dug down more than 200 feet, but many believe that the treasure lies much more deep, like as deep as 500 feet. As the diggers have gone deeper, they've encountered multiple booby traps, such as flood tunnels and stone plugs designed to protect whatever lies at the bottom. So far, the only artifacts that have been discovered are two links of a gold chain and a stone inscribed with the letters V, I, and C, which some believe stands for Viva Christo. Despite these discoveries, the mystery of the money pit remains unsolved. Many believe it contains a great treasure, while others think it may be a hoax. While hundreds of theories have been proposed, from hidden pirate booty to ancient Native American artifacts, no one knows what lies at the bottom of Oak Island Money Pit, and I'm not sure we ever will. Coming in at number 10, heroin used to be used as a children's cough syrup. Um. German drug company Bayer made a heck of a lot of money selling heroin to parents. Get a load of these babies! Heroin was a prescription drug in the US until 1914, and then it was banned in 1924. Can you imagine how children would be after a sweet dose of Bayer heroin? Like, Christ. Coming in at number 9, Hugo Boss designed Nazi party uniforms. Hugo Boss is a luxury German fashion house that now sells its product globally and is frequently seen on runways. The designer brand started up in 1924 and originally supplied the Nazi party. This all went down before and during World War II. Comedian Russell Brand was actually even ousted from the GQ Man of the Year awards after making Nazi jibes at the brand in 2013. So. Remember Thomas Edison from your history lessons, you know, the light bulb guy? Well, he had a very dark side that your teachers did not tell you about. He actually murdered an elephant, and this is coming in at number 8. Thomas Edison devoted his life to working with electricity. Unfortunately, he got pretty brutal when he needed to prove a point. In 1903, the American inventor murdered an elephant to prove that an alternating current was a bad idea. He even invited 1,500 people to watch as he murdered Topsy the Elephant at Luna Park Zoo on Coney Island. He also filmed it and released the footage to the public, and it's actually really heartbreaking to watch. I would say I'd boycott light bulbs, but not really an option. Coming in at number 7, remember that song that you guys used to sing as a kid in the playground, the Ring a Ring a Roses one? Well, it's actually a death song. Ring a Ring a Roses is a song about people dying from the plague. Ring a Ring a Roses, a pocket full of poses, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. You know how it goes. So, Ring O Roses refers to the rash that plague victims would develop. The pocket full of posies refers to herbs that people would carry around to protect themselves from the plague. The a tissue bit is like people sneezing like a sick person, and we all know what all fall down means. That's people physically dropping down dead. 
dead and dying from the plague. Fun. Okay, next up. In school, I was taught a lot about the Roman Empire, but I was never taught this. At number six, Romans used to use human urine as mouthwash and crushed mouse brains as toothpaste. Gross. Blah. Get the mouse brains out of my mouth. Get the mouse brains out of my mouth. I guess they had to keep their breaths fresh somehow, but yeah, I, I don't know. Urine wouldn't be my choice. They also used urine to clean their clothes. This is basically because ammonia, which is found in pee, takes out stains. So basically, they were more concerned with having white teeth than fresh, non pee smelling breath. Personally, I'd really pass on cleaning my teeth with pee and brains. It's just a personal choice. Coming in at number five, Saddam Hussein was actually given the key to the city of Detroit. History paints Saddam Hussein as a bad guy, mainly because he was indeed a bad guy. But nonetheless, after making a donation to a church in Detroit in 1979, basically because a reverend praised him, he was handed the city keys. The American history books aren't so proud of that one. Coming in at number four, Famous explorer Christopher Columbus used to rape children. Yeah, so I guess that kind of extinguishes the yay for Columbus and his explorations party. In some places, people even go as far as to celebrate a Christopher Columbus day. The problem is, not only was he awful to the indigenous people, he also raped them, including the kids. He would often give his lieutenants sex slaves, and he even wrote in one of his diaries that girls from age 9 to 10 were the most desirable. Gross. Gross. Coming in at number three, schools don't teach us much about Nazi twin experiments. I don't know how much history has shielded people about the kind of experiments that Nazi warlords did on concentration camp victims. Obviously, we know that they were gassed, but school history books do leave out a few choice facts. I know a lot about the Josef Mengele experiments, but that's because I've done extensive research on that area of history. A lot of people do not know about the veteran Nazis' sick experiments on twins and other such horrific medical tests. Mengele would inject chemicals into twins' bodies, especially their eyes, and try and change their colours. Later, when he was done with them, he'd murder them. Another Nazi, Isle Kopp, allegedly made lamps from human skin. Coming in at number two, we often don't know the extent of Japanese cruelty in World War II. Possibly because Hiroshima and Nagasaki were so horrific to humanity and the pain echoed throughout Japan for a great deal of time, the extent of Japanese killing in World War II is somewhat brushed over by history. Of course, all countries involved inflicted pain and suffering, but did you know that the Japanese torture methods were considered to be the most severe? Did you know that Japanese killed more Chinese soldiers than the number of the entire Jews killed in the Holocaust. Also, Japan wounded more Americans in Alaska than at Pearl Harbor. There were also swathes of reports of Japanese cannibalism and cruelty. Of course, this far into the future, we have to live and let live, but Nazi Germany gets the lion's share of the blame for atrocities, and Japanese war crimes are largely glossed over. Finally, just when you thought we were sort of semi living in a time of peace, you may not know that Russia and Japan are technically still at war. Two powerful countries who are still sour post World War II. Yeesh. Even though the countries haven't been engaging in hot war for over 70 years, they never signed a peace treaty officially indicating peacetime between the two nations. The pair still disagree heavily over the Kuril Islands. I for one really hope that they never engage in war again because that could be devastating for everyone. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot we have the Rhode Island Vampire. Admittedly witch and vampire hunts aren't exactly a topic covered in most history classes, but this is truly a pretty Pretty crazy story. In the late 1800s, tuberculosis was spreading pretty rapidly in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Vermont. This obviously would have been pretty terrifying for the residents of these places, but things quickly took a very dark turn. Since many of the people who were passing away from this illness appeared very obviously ill with sunken, drained faces, for some reason, the logical response was that people believed that they had been the prey of vampires. There was a family in Exeter, Rhode Island that had multiple people pass away from the illness, so some people believed that someone in this family must be the feeding vampire. They even went as far as to exhume the bodies of some of the deceased family members to make sure that they weren't undead. One of the exhumed bodies had passed away more recently, so her body was in better condition, which people of course took as a sign of her being a vampire. This led to them burning her heart and liver, and then they mixed the ashes with water. 
This is most definitely a crime today and pretty scary, but to make things even worse, they gave this concoction to other people in the town who had fallen ill as some kind of a cure. Imagine having to drink that and then still having tuberculosis after. Definitely not a good trade-off. In our number nine spot today, we have India and World War II. It would be shocking to hear of a school not teaching anything about World War II, but it's often that we don't truly get the full scope of what went on. One thing I saw brought up a few times was the role that India played in the war and what they went through. Firstly, if you didn't know, India played a huge part in the Second World War. We normally hear of the large death tolls from the war, such as the 418,000 Americans who died, or the 400 150,000 people from the UK, which don't get me wrong, is a huge and terrible number. But it is estimated that 3 million Indian people died in World War II, which is something I have literally never heard of anyone talk about before. India was fighting Japan, which for the record also had an extremely high death toll in this war, on the Eastern Front, and they were fighting Germany on the Western. World War II is a part of our global history, so why don't we talk about it and how it affected all of the countries? In our number eight spot today, we have the Acadian Expulsion. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far. This is something that happened in my own country, you guys, and I can honestly say this was never taught at the schools I attended. The Acadians were descendants of the 17th and 18th century French settlers who settled in the area that is now the Canadian Maritimes, so New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. In 1730, Acadians had to swear to British authorities that they would remain neutral on any conflict between Britain and France. Basically, one thing led to another, and the governor of Nova Scotia at the time, Charles Lawrence, saw the Acadians as some kind of a threat, and he also wondered why people who weren't from the area were allowed to live on such a beautiful part of the land. Well, isn't that real rich coming from someone who also wasn't from the area, but that is a whole separate conversation. Charles tried to force the Acadians to take an unqualified oath of allegiance to Britain, and when they refused, he imprisoned them and then ordered them to be deported. A man from New England called Charles Morris came up with the disgusting idea to surround the Acadian churches on a Sunday morning and capture as many people as possible while also burning their houses and crops. This whole situation led to approximately 10,000 Acadians being deported, and apparently this whole ordeal had a fatality rate of 53% for the Acadians. This whole thing is honestly pretty disgraceful, and it's just something that we don't talk about. In our number seven spot today, we have the Iranian Revolution of 1979. On August 19th, 1978, at the Cinema Rex in Abadan, Iran, there were hundreds of people watching a film when four men barricaded the doors, doused the cinema in gas, gasoline and lit the whole thing ablaze. This was a key event that led to the following revolution of 1979, but it truthfully had been building for quite some time, and this obviously wasn't the only event that led to this movement. This revolution was unique in the fact that it lacked a lot of the usual causes, such as a defeat in war, or a gigantic national debt, or an uprising of those in poverty. There is a lot that happened and a lot that went into this revolution, and I truly do not have time to cover in this video even half of it. But this revolution not only toppled Iran's absolute monarch, but it had worldwide political repercussions that are still seen today. In our number six spot today, we have Cyrus the Great. It is entirely possible that you may have learned about Cyrus the Great in school, as he was the founder of the Achaemenid Empire, but there is one thing he did that apparently a lot of us didn't know that possibly changed the course of our history. After he took Babylon over, he freed all of the captured slaves in the city and let them go back to their homelands. This included the Hebrews who were captured and enslaved from Judea. This may seem like a nice and reasonable thing to do, but it truly was more than that. By allowing these people to be free and return to their homes and continue practicing their religions, this may have been what has kept some religions alive. Without this move, it is possible that we may not have Judaism, Christianity, or Islam today, and that would have made our entire history very, very different. In our number five spot today, we have the Italian Renaissance dark side. When we think of the Italian Renaissance period, it is known for development and the rebirth that it caused, which makes a lot of sense considering the word Renaissance literally means rebirth. 
But there is one less glamorous and slightly frightening side to this period that isn't widely talked about. Sailors who had been returning from the New World at this point brought something less than lovely back with them, and that was syphilis, which spread through an entire French army. After this, the troops brought what was called the Great Pox to the rest of Europe. Since there was no penicillin or banana medicine back then, the disease spread rapidly and the symptoms were pretty gruesome. It would often happen that a person who had fallen ill would have the skin on their faces essentially be rotting away, which would leave large ulcers. Some people's noses and lips would be pretty much gone, and it happened often that people would sadly pass away from the disease. So basically what we think of as a beautiful time in Europe was both world changing, but also very scary and like, pretty close to a zombie apocalypse. In our number four spot today, we have the history of dentures. I suppose this one is less of an event and more of a weird practice, but I just had to include it. I don't have a ton of experience with dentures, but they seem to be a pretty straightforward thing these days, aside from the cost of dental, but things weren't always the way they are today. Instead of dentures being made of fake teeth, before they used to be made with real human teeth, which is absolutely disgusting to me. After the Battle of Waterloo, scavengers went and took the teeth off of the corpses, which is quite a job, and then they sold these teeth to dentists. These dentists would boil the teeth, chop the roots off, and then attach these teeth to ivory base plates and then sell them to the customers. Aside from this being an extremely morally questionable practice in its entirety, it is also just so creepy. In our number three spot today, we have telephone cats. If you're a cat person, you might want to skip over this number. In 1929, two scientists at Princeton University wanted to conduct an experiment in order to test how auditory nerves perceive sounds. This is obviously extremely important research, but the way they went about this is truly messed up. They took a sedated but alive cat and cut out a part of its brain. They then attached one end of a telephone wire to the cat's auditory nerve, and then the other end to a telephone receiver. When one of these scientists spoke into the cat's ear, the other one could hear it on the other end. This is cool, but most definitely not an excuse to do something so inhumane. There were of course benefits to this experiment, and it is believed that this may have helped lead to the development of cochlear implants, which is of course an incredibly important scientific advancement. The worst part, however, while the cat actually survived this experiment, instead of treating it like a king for the rest of its life, like it truly deserved, these scientists instead decided to kill it to see if the experiment would still work on a dead cat. It didn't. In our number two spot today, we have the smallpox pandemic. I'm sure at some point or another, most of us learned about smallpox and the epidemic, which is something that we luckily don't really have to worry about much anymore. But one thing a lot of people explained that they didn't know was how badly it devastated indigenous peoples. Europeans who came over to America brought with them a multitude of diseases that they would have had some immunity to, considering it was likely their bodies had encountered it before. But this was not the case for those already living on the land that is now referred to as North America. Indigenous Americans not only had no immunity towards this disease, but also their traditional ways of treating illness may have only exacerbated the symptoms. Because of course, how could you possibly know how to treat something that you've never seen before and with no help from the people who actually do know. It has been estimated that the spread of this disease caused the population of indigenous Americans to decline by 70%. That is absolutely insane. There is a theory that this spread of disease may have been one of the only things that led to the colonization of North America. In our number one spot today, we have the Tulsa Massacre. This is one that many people, including people from Tulsa, explained that they didn't really learn much about in school. This event occurred on May 31st and June 1st of 1921, and it has actually been called the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. This happened in the Greenwood district of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and basically just mobs of white racist people went out and attacked black residents and businesses. What started this was when a 19 year old black man named Dick Rowland was accused of harming a 17 year old white girl and he was subsequently arrested and there were rumors that he was going to be lynched. This of course drew a bunch of racist white people out of their homes to participate, but then a group of around 75 black men also showed up to make sure that he didn't get lynched. One thing led to another and a firefight 
gunfight broke out that led to 10 of the white people and two of the black people being killed. After this, all hell broke loose. Just last year, the last living survivor of the massacre, R&B and jazz saxophonist Hal Singer passed away at the age of 100. And just last year, this massacre finally became a part of the Oklahoma State curriculum, and it's about time. Only a century too late. I also feel like in that I didn't include, but I should have said that thing after the lynching was like only the beginning of it. And then everything got crazy and way, way, way more people died and it was really destructive. I just didn't want anyone to think that I was making it seem like it wasn't as bad as it was because it really, really was. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have lobotomies. Did you know that it used to be common practice for people to just get a part of their brain cut out? Okay, well maybe not common, but it wasn't as uncommon as you would hope. Lobotomies used to be considered an excellent and efficient cure for things such as mental health problems, which thankfully is a practice that has not survived for a very good reason. Of course, in modern medicine, they do still exist, but only when actually necessary, and there is of course a lot more knowledge about the dangers and effects. One well-known person to have undergone one of these procedures was Rosemary Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's sister. She was experiencing seizures as well as mood swings, and while the seizures certainly were something that needed to be looked after for her health, I'm not sure if the mood swings necessarily needed some kind of medical intervention. Anyways, to cure her, they had a lobotomy performed on her. This procedure left her with the mental capacity of a two-year-old and she could no longer speak or walk properly. After this, she spent most of the rest of her life life hidden away and it was thought that her family did this because they were ashamed of her, which is both horrible and so sad. In our number 9 spot today we have the English Civil War. This might be something that is taught more often in English schools, but admittedly it's something I didn't even hear mentioned throughout my time in school. This was actually a series of civil wars that took place between 1642 and 1651, and while it is often referred to as one event, it can be divided into three separate wars. These wars were mostly in relation to the manner of England's governance as well as pertaining to religious freedoms. The first war was from 1642 to 1646, and the second was from 1648 to 1649. Both the first and second wars saw supporters of King Charles I battling against supporters of the Long Parliament. The third war took place from 1649 until 1651, and this one saw the supporters of King Charles II fighting against the supporters of the Rump Parliament. In the end, these wars saw the execution of King Charles I the exile of his son, King Charles II, and the replacement of the English monarchy with the Commonwealth of England. There's so much more information about what went on and who was fighting in these wars, but I unfortunately don't have time to cover all of it in the short amount of time we have, but it certainly was a revolutionary period for England, Scotland, and Ireland, and it really was concerned with how these three kingdoms should be governed. In our number 8 spot today, we have William the Conqueror. This one is a bit more well known than some of the others on this list today, but I want to specifically talk about one thing in reference to this that is much less well known. In 1807, William the Conqueror decided to take on an all alcohol diet. This is because he was suffering from extreme obesity and was struggling because of that fact. Because of this, he told his staff that he would only drink wine until his weight went down, but he ended up passing away less than a year later, and most of us are told that this was obviously because of the wine only diet. But that's not actually true. In an astonishing turn of events, this wine only diet actually worked. Shortly after beginning his diet, he was able to ride his horse again, which was one of the main reasons he started the diet in the first place, as he was previously too heavy for the horse to carry. He actually died after falling from his horse during an expedition, which was completely unrelated to either his weight or his diet. It's entirely possible that had he not gone on this diet, he would have never ridden his horse and maybe would have lived longer. Truth Hopefully who knows, but I suppose in a very roundabout way he did still kind of die from this wine only diet. In our number 7 spot today we have the World War II dogs. A lot of us have learned quite a bit about World War II as it affected everyone at the time and was obviously a huge deal. We all have slightly different perspectives on it depending where you grew up and went to school, but it's something that is still widely talked about today. There is so much to cover on this topic so of course some of it ends up getting left out of the history textbooks, but that doesn't mean the knowledge 
doesn't survive in some capacity. For today's list I want to talk about a technique that was used in Russia during World War II that ended up completely backfiring. In Russia they had trained dogs with bombs strapped onto their backs to run under tanks. I'd like to think that this technique also saw the dog being able to leave the bomb there so that they could escape, but that is most likely wishful thinking, but that isn't even what I wanted to talk about today. While this is I suppose a good tactic for fighting a war, there was one grave oversight during this training. All the dogs were of course trained using Russian tanks, since that's where and who they were being trained by, so when it came time for the real deal, these dogs couldn't differentiate between a Russian tank or an enemy tank, which then saw the dogs running under what they knew, which were the Russian tanks. Certainly not the outcome that they were expecting. In our number 6 spot today we have Mary Shelley. We all know Mary Shelley as the author of Frankenstein, but there's one super creepy and kind of sad thing about her that is much less well known. Mary's husband was a man named Percy and when he was 29 years old he was sailing with two other men and on July 8th, 1822 they got caught up in a storm and ended up drowning. The bodies of the men were found 10 days later and they were only able to be identified based on their clothing. This of course is extremely tragic and sad and of course it would have been so awful for Mary to have to lose her husband at all, let alone in this way. Percy ended up being cremated and for some reason his heart was the only part of his body that refused to burn, which I guess now physicians suggest was due to calcification from an earlier bout with tuberculosis. While this in itself is pretty freaky, at first Percy's friend Lee Hunter ended up keeping his heart, but later it was turned over to Mary. Instead of disposing of the heart or doing anything normal with it, Mary ended up keeping the heart and she carried it with her for years. No one knew about this odd little keepsake until a year after her death when it was found in the drawer of her desk, wrapped up in the pages of one of his last poems. What a simultaneously heartbreakingly beautiful, but also ultra creepy story. The heart ended up being buried in the family vault with Percy and Mary's son after he passed away in 1889. In our number 5 spot today we have strange medicine. It's not necessarily uncommon for us to hear about strange things that people in the past used to do, but sometimes those strange things are also disgusting. It was extremely common in the past for people to use human remains as a form of medicine. You'd think at some point they'd realize that these remains truly were doing more harm than good. Well, I guess we did, but it did go on for much longer than it should have. The cannibalistic treatments would consist of things such as blood, ground up human skull, and even human fat. Tomb raiders would even steal remains in order for them to be sold to the wealthy, which is incredibly dark, and apparently mummy remains were the ideal remains for these sorts of things, which led to a shortage of mummies. I never thought I'd be in a position where I'd be talking about a shortage of mummies, but truly anything can happen over here at Most Amazing Top 10. I guess who am I to judge these past decisions, but all I can say is that I am very glad this is one we have moved on from. In our number 4 spot today we have the Chilean Civil War. Just to throw another war into the mix today, let's talk about the Chilean Civil War of 1891. The short of it on this war is that the president at the time, Jose Manuel Balmaceda, tried to give himself a lot more power than he probably should have had. The congress weren't exactly thrilled about that, so they and the Chilean navy rebelled against the president and the army. The navy made the smart move by going north and seizing the nitrate mines which were very economically important. From there they sailed south. Like any war there of course was a lot that went on but ultimately the navy and congress were successful and victorious. This war was actually the first war where modern torpedoes were used and were actually successful although it took all of the torpedoes they had in just one attack. Part of the reason the navy was so successful in this war because not only were they able to dominate on land but also sea. This really led other countries to realize how vital it was for them to have modern ships and naval defenses. It also made other countries realize how important it was for them to have modern weapons. This war may be lesser known and less discussed, but it certainly was an eye opener for a lot of other countries. In our number 3 spot today we have King Gojian of Yue. King Gojian of Yue had his reign from 496 BC until 465 BC. His reign took place during what was arguably the last major conflict of the spring and autumn period and he was able to lead his state to victory, but it certainly wasn't an easy road or without some very creepy happenings. The major conflict he led his state through
through was the war between Wu and Yue, which started when a Yue princess, who was married to a prince of Wu, left her husband and fled back to Yue. I mean, this of course wasn't the only thing that caused the war, but it certainly sparked the fire. King Gojian was an extremely humble king as he wouldn't relish in the riches he had as most royals would. Instead, he ate the same food as peasants and often would leave himself hungry in order to remember that he was in a position to serve his state. Okay, so you might be sitting there wondering when I'm going to get to the scary historical event that you came to this video for, so here it is. As I mentioned before, he was able to lead his state to victory, but of course a war involves a lot of sacrifice and some pretty horrific happenings. King Gojian's army was very well known for their ability to scare their enemies before battle began, and this is because their frontline consisted of criminals who had been sentenced to death. In this time, there wasn't lethal injection or the electric chair, so naturally it was a lot more of a vicious process. These criminals would decapitate themselves in front of the enemy army. Yep, I think this is probably the definition of a scary historical event. I can't even imagine witnessing something like that and then having to proceed with a battle against the army that has people doing that sort of thing. King Gojian was certainly not a leader who was wasting time messing around. In our number two spot today, we have Topsy the Elephant. Topsy was a female Asian elephant who was born in Southeast Asia around 1875. She was secretly brought into the United States shortly after and was unfortunately added to a circus who advertised her as the first elephant elephant born in the US, despite that obviously not being true. During her 25 years with the circus, she gained a reputation as a bad elephant, and after she ended up killing a guest at the circus, she was sold to Coney Island's Sea Lion Park in 1902. The Sea Lion Park was eventually sold and renamed to Luna Park, and during Topsy's time here, she was involved in quite a few highly publicized incidents, which could be attributed to her drunken handler, the publicity-hungry owners of the circus, as well as the fact that this is all a perfect example of why animals that belong in the wild should be in the wild. In the end, all of the horrible people who had a hand in Topsy being in this circus decided that since she was such a problem, they would execute her publicly. They were going to hang her, but because people thought that that was inhumane, they decided to take a different route. For the record, I just want to say that the execution of Topsy was inhumane no matter what method they chose, because Topsy didn't deserve to be in this kind of an environment. On January 4th of 1903, Topsy was fed carrots that were laced with potassium cyanide, and she was also electrocuted and strangled. To make this horrific day even worse, the event was both spectated and the Edison Manufacturing Movie Company was there to film the whole thing. Many people believe Thomas Edison was actually there himself, but that is something that is up for debate. This whole situation is absolutely heartbreaking, and Topsy deserved a lot better than everything she had to go through. In our number one spot today, we have The Red Summer. The Red Summer is something I didn't even even here mentioned in school, which is honestly absolutely shocking. I'm hoping this is something that is more commonly taught than I think it is, because it certainly is very important. The Red Summer is the term used to refer to the period from the late winter through to the early autumn of 1919, in which white supremacist terror and racial riots took place in more than three dozen cities across America. Some of the more well-known race riots that took place during the Red Summer were the Chicago and Washington DC riots, and the Red Summer also saw the Elaine massacre that took place in Elaine, Arkansas, which saw the deaths of between 100 to 240 black Americans. These anti-black riots are said to have developed from a multitude of post-World War I tensions, such as the economic slump and the competition in job and housing markets. In 1919, it certainly wasn't uncommon for there to be race riots and a multitude of white on black violence, but the Red Summer really marked some of the first race riots in which black people in number stood up to the white supremacy, resisted, and fought back. During the Red Summer, a civil rights activist named A. Philip Randolph publicly defended the right of black people to self-defense. It is said that between January 1st and September 14th of 1919, white mobs lynched at least 43 black Americans, but despite this, the states refused to interfere or prosecute these mobs. Considering how many race riots went on during this summer, we truly could dedicate an entire video to the Red Summer. It is insane to think about how recent 1919 really was, and while we certainly have come a long way, there is always more work to be done, and part of the work involves us learning about these horrible histories and what happened in our past. Starting off at 
at number 10, vampire killings. So starting us off, we have the supposed vampire killings from the 1800s. Now, spoiler alert here, they weren't actually vampires. Well, I guess I don't know that for sure, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say they weren't. Anyways, back in the 1800s, people in New England believed that cadavers were rising from their graves at night and preying on the living. So to solve this problem, they began exhuming the cadavers. Now, some kept it simple and just turned the cadaver face down, but others jumped to more extreme methods like ripping the bones apart and rearranging them, or burning the deceased person's heart and inhaling the smoke. Apparently at the time, it was believed inhaling the smoke cured tuberculosis, though I can only imagine it made matters much worse for them. Some towns were so into the ritual that they would even hold festivals during the process and celebrate the exhumation and subsequent destruction of the corpses all together. So while it was incredibly unsettling, they did truly believe they were vampires haunting them in the night, so I guess it gave them some peace of mind. Next up at number 9, dentures. While today dentures are made from composite resin or sometimes porcelain, during the 18th and 19th centuries, of course, those materials weren't available. But as you can imagine, people were still losing teeth at an even higher rate due to the high sugar diet, attempted teeth whitening, which was really just wearing away their enamel instead of brightening it, and the overall lack of knowledge around hygiene. So dentures were still needed and wanted by many. So what was their material of choice? Well, for the easiest and most profitable route, many would acquire the teeth from dead bodies. Although if you had some money, you might be able to afford dentures made from ivory. Other materials were sometimes the teeth of animals or wood, but honestly, I think we can all agree that none of those sound like terribly sanitary options, considering professional physicians at the time weren't sterilizing instruments, and some didn't even believe in disinfecting prior to surgery. Next up at number 8, stained glass. If you walk into just about any old church, you'll notice the walls are decorated with beautiful stained glass. But what might surprise you is that in some of the particularly older pieces, there is a strange ingredient that helps it all come together. In 1112, a German monk wrote about the process of creating the beautifully colored glass and as he detailed, it starts off innocently enough, adding sand and potash at a high temp until it becomes molten. From there, they'd add a stabilizer before coloring the glass with different metallic oxides like copper, cobalt, and gold. But once the glass was cooled and shaped, the small details were added by paint. They made the paint usually from lead or copper and would then suspend it in urine. So quite literally, some of those old stained glass windows were painted with pea paint. Which I mean kind of just makes me giggle if I'm honest, but it is definitely a weird ingredient to think about being in paint. Coming in at number 7, leather bound books. Nowadays it's unusual to even find real leather on anything, but once upon a time the leather on books wasn't even from cows, it was from people. Called anthropodermic bibliopegy, the books were made in a similar way as they would now, but obviously with one huge difference. They used human skin instead of an animal. While there are actually only 18 confirmed books of its kind that still exist, we have no idea just how many there could have been all those years ago. Allegedly the books were usually made from executed convicts, and during the French Revolution there were rumors that a tannery for human human skin was established outside of Paris. I mean, it kind of gives me the willies to think about it, and I'm just glad we've moved on to a different material to bind our books today. Next up at number 6, Minnie Dean. Wilhelmina Dean, or Minnie as she was often referred to, was a nanny in New Zealand during 1880 and was a well-known caretaker in her town. But something was off with the woman, and soon she began having quite the dark spot on her name and career. In 1889, one of the young people under her care suddenly died, as if out of nowhere, and initially it was viewed as a freak accident, but two years later the same thing happened again. Now with two minors perished under her care, police decided to investigate further into the matter. After a bit of sleuthing, it was concluded that under Minnie's care, the two minors were 
as she was attempting to take out life insurance on them. Police immediately took the remaining young boy in her care, finding it in dirty clothes and drinking curdled milk. By 1895, the investigation into her crimes continued and she was spotted trying to flee on a train with another victim in her arms. And when police searched her house, they found three more covered up victims. Eventually found guilty for all her crimes, she was the first and only woman ever hanged in New Zealand. Next up at number 5, Radiation Test Subject. In 1999, a man named Hisachi Uchi was a power plant technician and he became known for being exposed to the highest amount of radiation of any human in history. While working at the Tokamura nuclear power plant, after a lack of safety protocols, improper training, and just an overall pressure to meet deadlines, Uchi and his co-workers made a terrible error. They mistakenly mixed an incorrect measurement of radioactive materials into the wrong tank. And as you've probably figured out, it caused a near fatal burst of gamma rays. Hisashi, who happened to be the closest to the incident, was brutally injured and sent to the hospital. Once he was there, it was discovered he had no more white blood cells, so essentially meaning that he had no remaining immune system. And despite being in intense pain with a rapidly deteriorating condition, doctors kept him alive under the family's request. So for 83 days, Uchi remained alive, being used as a test subject for experimental radiation treatment by the doctors, which, I mean, in their defense was the request of the family, but still, he endured several cardiac arrests, lost all of his skin, and suffered brain damage as well as organ failure. One of the last things Uchi ever said was, quote, I can't take it anymore, I'm not a guinea pig. And then finally, one more cardiac arrest released him from his torture. Coming in at number 4, Mumia. Most widely practiced between the 12th to the 17th century, although there were a few cases in the 18th century that pop up, Mumia was widely used as a means of medicine in many European countries. Now, if you can't tell by the name, Mamiya is creepily just as it sounds, the use of human remains to fix a living person's ailments. It was believed by many of the top physicians at the time that ingesting certain remains prompted the medicinal power of the mummy and could cure things like coagulated blood, pain, coughs, inflammation, cramps, and even heal open wounds. Now, they didn't just sit around eating the carcass directly, instead they would either grind the bones into a powder and drink it from there, or drink an extracted liquid from the embalmed individual. In fact, it was so popular at one point that it's believed the reason there are so few mummies these days is because of the high demand of flesh at the time. Coming in at number 3, James Jameson. One of the heirs to the Jameson whiskey family fortune, Jameson considered himself to be an adventurer of sorts and often traveled to far off lands detailing the trips in his diary. In 1888, Jameson decided to head out to explore the Congo, and while there he wrote about and demanded some gruesome things from the locals. So before beginning this expedition, Jameson discovered that the area he was visiting was known to have a population that participated in the eating of other humans. Apparently Jameson set out to witness it firsthand, which I mean, why was that his dream? A little suspicious if you ask me, but I digress. <laughs> According to Assad Faran, who was his translator for the trip, Jameson bought a girl from a trader of slaves for a few handkerchiefs and gave her over to the tribe to be eaten. Allegedly, he didn't pay the tribe directly, but in a roundabout way, he did sort of pay to have this girl killed. What's even more gross is that he proceeded to draw and paint watercolors of the gruesome event while it happened. Which again, just wrong on so many levels. Coming in at number 2, Cambodian Barbies. You may have been taught about the Khmer Rouge in history class, but if they don't ring a bell, essentially they were an extreme communist regime in Cambodia that held government between 1975 to 1979. They were known for being extremely cruel and committed some of the most horrifying acts of genocide in history, with nearly 2 million perishing under their ruling. Now, during their radical rule, the entire country was isolated from all all 
foreign influences. This included closing schools, hospitals, factories, banks, foreign agriculture. They believed this would stimulate the rebirth of the country, but of course, all it did was send it into desolate famine and poverty. Led by a man named Pol Pot, the people of the country could not forage for food, despite the fact that everyone was starving, and anyone who disobeyed the orders was killed. Apparently, as the people became more and more desperate, they began to turn to folk magic, turning Barbie dolls into smoking talismans for luck. Thankfully, since its dissolution in 1999, all the leaders have been jailed for their atrocities, and the people are freed from the genocidal regime. And last up in our number one spot, the Rabbit Woman. Her name was Mary Toft, and in 1726, she became known throughout Surrey, England, as having been the woman who gave birth to rabbits. Now, I know what you're thinking, that isn't possible. And you would be right. But still, the story of how she convinced people it was real was crazy. Apparently, Toft was actually pregnant at one point, but miscarried, and it could have been this that sent her into her madness. Madness. Toft began declaring that she was giving birth to various animal parts, and so her local doctor became involved in the case. At first, everyone actually believed her, as in fact, a rabbit did, well, come out of her. And with a doctor backing up her claims, the king and his royal surgeon got involved. Unlike her local doctor, the king's surgeon was skeptical, and after discovering corn inside the stomach of one of the rabbits and hay in their droppings, it proved the animal hadn't developed inside Mary. Eventually, Mary Toft admitted to the hoax and explained that she had manually inserted the animals inside her to make the delivery as realistic as possible. She was immediately imprisoned for fraud, and the medical community was ridiculed for having been fooled. Starting us off at number 10, we have mummy unwrapping parties. So we already know that people love to do all kinds of weird and strange things with mummies back in the day, but after people widely stopped eating them or using their remains to make medicines, a new mummy trend began. After Napoleon's first expedition to Egypt in 1798, Europeans began to become even more enthralled with mummies than they ever had been. In the 19th century, a mummy craze began. Travelers began bringing back whole mummies they had bought off the street in Egypt. And the next thing you know, they were no longer thought of having medicinal purposes, but rather being a wonderful party activity. Soon it became customary to hold mummy unwrapping parties, and wealthy Victorians would gather around as the host slowly unwrapped the dead body, showing off his wealth while simultaneously giving guests a thrilling evening filled with horror and delight. I have no clue what was done with the mummies after the public unboxing, but somehow I almost think it's better, as, as I'm sure whatever happened next was even more disgusting. Number 9. Bomb Shadows We all likely know and were taught about the devastating bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that killed 226,000 people in 1945. But one thing that you may not have learned about was what those bombs left behind. Apparently, as the attack was happening, the light and heat from the weapon was absorbed by the people and the objects in front of it. The surrounding light and heat then ended up bleaching the areas of the ground where nothing had been, leaving objects and people-shaped marks on the pavement. They became known as the Shadows of the Dead, and even now, after nearly 80 years, some of the shadows remain stained into the pavement and walls all over the city, as a reminder to the human capacity for destruction. Coming in at number 8, Vlad the Impaler. Born into a royal family in 1431, Vlad III was son of Vlad Dracul, the ruler of Wallachia at the time. During this time, Transylvania faced a lot of battles and bloodshed as the Ottoman Empire kept trying to push west towards Europe and the Christian Crusaders marched eastward towards the Holy Land. In 1442, Vlad Dracul was called to a diplomatic meeting with the Ottomans and brought with him his son. But the meeting was a trap, and all three were arrested and held hostage. The father was granted to leave as long as he left his sons behind, and he agreed. So for the next few years, Vlad and his brother were trapped and tortured, although they did also strangely tutor the men in science, philosophy, and art, as well as turn them into warriors. Eventually, his brother and father both died, and Vlad was released. 
Soon after, he became the leader of Wallachia, and when the city of Constantinople fell to the Ottomans, Vlad led the force to defend his land from an invasion. It was during this time he became known as Vlad the Impaler, as he often used metal or wooden poles to impale invaders right through their chest, or sometimes he would even insert it vertically up the victim until it pierced through their shoulders, neck, or mouth. While well respected, he became notorious for killing thousands of people and eventually became the inspiration for Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Count Dracula. Coming in at number 7, incubators. Nowadays, incubators are seen as life saving devices for premature newborns, but shockingly, this was not always the attitude towards them. During the early 20th century, most physicians kind of held the belief that premature infants were not meant to survive. And so they they were tragically just kind of left to die in most cases. But Martin Cooney held a different belief from his peers and wanted to try and change the narrative. But in order to do so, he had to make it a spectacle. One thing that people loved to do back in the day was gawk at the unusual, laugh at the different. And it's for that very reason that sideshows existed. So in order to save the lives of the preemies, Cooney decided to display them in what he called hatcheries as a sideshow in Coney Island. For for a quarter, visitors could gaze upon the peculiar and small young people, and over the years, he managed to save more than 6,500 lives by packaging up their safety in a swallowable pill for the times he lived in. After so much success, doctors started coming around his ideas, and now they are used by hospitals around the world. Next up at number 6, Pharaoh Pepe. Although the exact timeline is up for debate, somewhere around 2278 BC to 2260. 16 BC, Pharaoh Pepi II reigned in Egypt. The ruler succeeded the throne at age 6 and became widely known as being one of Egypt's most demanding kings, which comes with little to no surprise that a literal first grader being given the power of a pharaoh affected his ego in a negative way. Often he demanded outlandish tasks of his slaves and subjects, but most strange of all was his practice to keep flies off of him. Apparently he hated flies more than than anything in the world, so Pepe would force several slaves a day to be covered head to toe in honey and then stand naked by him in hopes to attract the bugs towards them and off himself. By the end of their days, his slaves would be covered in bites, boils, and sores caused by the countless insects that swarmed to them, and soon they would often succumb to diseases like malaria. Later on, flies actually became more or less a creature of high esteem for the Egyptians, becoming a symbol for persistent and tenacity, but for the near 90 year or so reign under Pepe, they were apparently the worst creature alive. Coming in at number 5, a cat phone. In 1929, a pair of scientists at Princeton University had a question. They wanted to test out how the auditory nerve perceives sound. But in order to test that, they had to find a subject. Now, as you can imagine, not too many people were lining up for this. So they ultimately decided to perform the experiment on a cat. The cat was heavily sedated prior to the operation, where the scientists cut out parts of its brain before attaching one end of a telephone wire into its auditory nerve and the other end into a receiver. Shockingly, the cat survived the operation and the scientists went forward with their experiment. To their delight, they discovered that if you spoke into the cat's ear, you could hear it perfectly through the receiver. But their initial success was not enough for them. Next, they had to know if it worked once the cat was dead. So they killed the cat to test their theory, but sadly the cat phone no longer functioned without access to a functional brain. Despite its rather gruesome story, the two did actually contribute to a valuable understanding of the brain and helped future researchers in development of cochlear implants. So at least it wasn't all in vain. Coming in at number 4, death photography. Memento mori means remember you must die. For centuries, trinkets were used to keep the thought of death close and to help the living through their grieving process. In Victorian times, this looked like lockets filled with hair of the dead, a mask of your loved one created out of wax, or by having paintings and sculptures made in their memory. But all of a sudden, a new invention came along that led to creating an all new kind of memento mori, the photograph. As its popularity increased, the price of having your photo taken was all of a sudden cheaper than a portrait, and many began using this new technology to keep 
the essence of their loved ones preserved forever. Next thing you know, families are getting photos taken with their dead family members, and for many, it was even the first time getting a photo taken. The dead were sometimes propped up to look alive, while other times eyeballs were painted on after it developed to give them a more lifelike look. The pictures would be hung in the house just like any normal family portrait and served as a reminder to the family of the ones they lost. Thankfully, the practice went out of style as healthcare began to improve and less people were dying so young. Coming in at number three, gibbeting. During medieval times, the practice of execution was really just an average Tuesday afternoon, and even darker was that it was pretty common practice for criminals to be left on the gallows after they were hanged, as sort of a warning sign to the others in the town. But another form of torturous death they made criminals endure was called gibbeting. The ancient practice consisted of humiliating and hanging a criminal from a large post, but unlike being hanged, the convict was stuffed inside a small cage that was left dangling in the air. The victim would be put in the cage completely alive and essentially left to rot, while people of the town gathered round to witness the spectacle, often even torturing the criminal in their own ways. Eventually, after starvation, cold, and muscle atrophy, they would die and their rotting bodies would be left inside the hanging cage for weeks, sometimes even years, until nothing but their skeletons remained inside. Eventually, the practice was outlawed by the mid 1800s, but some say that if you walk past an old gibbeting cage, you can still hear the screams of the soul who died inside. Coming in at number two, chats with a severed head. In the early 1900s, a French physician named Gabriel Baudieu was interested in exploring the connection between mind, brain, and body. So in 1905, when the execution of Henri Langui was announced, he rushed to the guillotine to study the aftermath. Baudieu claimed that after the guillotine dropped and the head fell to the ground, he called out to the victim and the severed head allegedly blinked his eyes as if awakening. He wrote, the eyelids lifted up, this time I swear, in a distinctly normal movement, slow as if awakening or torn from thought. He further detailed that the pupils focused in on him until slowly the eyelids faded closed. But once again, he called the man's name and his eyes opened. Some believe that it was simply leftover nerve impulses, but Gabriel swore that the head could hear him and understand him. He said he felt something look looking into his eyes and knew it wasn't just a coincidence. And last up today, the Leningrad famine. For 872 days, the people of Leningrad suffered one of the most destructive military blockades in history. In just a little less than three years, the population dropped from 2.5 million to just 800,000. In September of 1941, they were bombarded by the Axis powers and cut off from the outside world, receiving no wood, no gas, no coal, and no food. And it only got worse once winter hit. Soon they were trying to stay alive with no food in negative 40 degree temperatures, and so many resorted to burning their possessions just to evade death one more day. But as time went on, it only got darker and darker. People would leave their homes and never return. At first, many assumed they died in the cold, but suddenly it was happening more and more frequently. It didn't take too long to draw a connection to the mysterious disappearances, as the next day there would magically be meat available at the market, usually labeled as horse or dog. Soon after, people began killing firsthand, just to feed themselves, and some some were even driven to kill their own families just to survive. Officially, there are 2,000 recorded cases of eating human flesh, but it's believed to be much higher. All the while, of course, the elite hoarded food that came into the city via the lakes and never once went hungry. There are journal recordings from the same time about eating goose and caviar at a party while the commoners froze to death in the streets. Starting us off at number 10 is divorce. Well, today you can pretty much get a divorce for 
Well, really any reason you want, that wasn't always the case. In fact, prior to being able to file over irreconcilable differences like most couples do now, pretty much only men were allowed to divorce their wives, not the other way around. Unless that is, the wife could prove her husband's impotence. As it was seen as a woman's legal duty to bestow a child to her husband, if he couldn't give her the goods per se, she could file for an annulment of the marriage. But how did the court go about proving this, you ask? Well, of course they couldn't just take the woman's word for it, so they would bring in a witness, usually a sex worker, to try and arouse the man. That or the court would enter your marital bedroom and, well, you know, see for themselves just how well the man could get the job done. If he did in fact have any issues completing his manly duties, the woman could be freed of the marriage. Just be careful they don't accuse you of becoming a witch. Next up at number 9 is man-made fertilizer. The Battle of Waterloo in 1815 resulted in the death of an estimated 60,000 soldiers, but not many of these bones have ever been recovered. And the reason why is pretty grim. In a strange, twisted series of events, the English decided to clear the field of the corpses and put the bones to use in a rather effective, but albeit creepy way. Newspapers of the time reported that the fallen French army were ground up in Yorkshire factories and the bone dust was added to their manure. Apparently the oil from the marrow proved especially helpful in the grave robbing turned fertilizer plan, and the fertilizer was purchased by farmers across England and scattered widely to help grow their crops. Meaning that an entire generation of England ate food made possible with the help of dead French soldiers. Coming in at number 8 is Ching Shi Huang. Before the understanding of modern science, there was a lot of ideas about elixirs and remedies that have quite literally no logic to back them up. Now of course, it wasn't their fault. They truthfully didn't know any better. But looking back, that doesn't make it any less wild. The first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang, was one of the many intent on finding the elixir of immortality, and so he demanded his royal doctors find this magical potion for him, otherwise he would have them killed. I mean, just real low stakes stuff. Eventually, likely under the duress of not wanting to be killed, and also probably not knowing what they were doing, they offered him a magic potion that they promised would bring him eternal life. The magic potion, however, was actually just mercury, and the emperor ended up dying from poisoning himself. A bit ironic that in the pursuit of eternal life, he actually only made his life shorter. Coming in at number 7 is Henry Rathbone. During school, we all learn about John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated President Lincoln at the Ford's Theatre in Washington. But did you know that that wasn't the only tragedy to occur due to that night's events? In the theatre with Lincoln that night was his wife, along with Henry Rathbone, a military officer, and his girlfriend Clara. At the time of the assassination, Rathbone saw Booth and tried to save Lincoln, but Booth stabbed him before he could reach the president. Although he physically survived the attack, he left with a deep-seated guilt about not being able to save the president's life. Two years went by, and and despite trying to move on from the tragedy by marrying Clara and starting a family, his mind never fully recovered and he became more and more paranoid about the world around him. He began claiming to hear voices speak to him from behind the walls that would taunt him endlessly, until eventually they pushed him towards complete breakdown. Convinced it was the only option, Rathbone shot and killed his wife before stabbing himself in an attempt to take his own. But just like before, he survived the attack on himself. Eventually he was tried for killing his wife and sent to live the rest of his life in an asylum. Coming in at number 6 is an animal trial. So not only did they have trials over the impotence of a man, believe it or not, you could also take a literal animal to court in the middle ages. I kid you not. The whole kid and caboodle would be present. A judge, prosecutor, witnesses, a defense attorney. They truly took it very seriously. The reasoning behind it all, I suppose, was that at the time, law prohibited punishment without trial. For for everything and everyone. The first recorded instance was the prosecution of a pig in France in 1266 accused of eating a young boy. The pig was found guilty for his crime and executed as punishment. If that doesn't sound crazy enough, keep in mind the judge would 
uphold the behavior of the accused animal against it. And if the court didn't feel the animal was acting properly, that was taken into account. These trials were only put on against domestic animals as they truly believed having been in the company of humans, they should know how to act. Now, not all animals were executed for their crimes. Some lesser criminals were merely excommunicated from the church or cursed and sent to live in the wild. But it's still crazy. I mean, honestly, I wish I was making this up. Coming in at number five is John Scott Harrison. Raised by the ninth president of the US, William Henry, and the father of the 23rd president, Benjamin Harrison, although John Scott himself never rose to presidential ranks, he did serve two years in Congress and was a prominent political figure in his time. But one day he decided politics wasn't really for him anymore and spent his last 20 years managing a farm in Ohio. After his death in 1878, his family gathered for the service and took great pains to protect his grave. At the time, grave robbing was at an all time peak due to the demand for cadavers in medical schools. To avoid having his father be another subject of this, Benjamin had an unusually deep grave made and placed a massive stone that required 16 men to move placed on top of his casket. For extra measure, he then covered the whole ordeal in cement, then placed small wooden pegs below the surface of the covering so that he could tell if it had been disturbed. Oh, and he hired a security guard to watch it day and night for the next 30 days. After noticing a nearby family friend's grave had been exhumed, Benjamin and his nephew went to go and track it down. They managed to obtain a warrant for the Medical College of Ohio and with the help of a detective went to retrieve the corpse of their dear friend. When they arrived, they found a dissecting room on the top floor, but to their surprise, they couldn't find who they were looking for. Instead, they happened upon a body that looked strangely familiar. And when they removed the rags covering the head, they were horrified to discover it was the corpse of one Mr. John Scott Harrison. How the grave robber managed, we will never know. Next up at number four is La Custa. The Pax Romana is known for being one of the most peaceful times in history. The Romans had pretty much conquered what they set out to, and so they began to, you know, just chill out for a bit. Then along came La Custa, esteemed maker of poisons and the world's first serial killer. Well, more like a hired assassin by the Roman Empire. Locusta was routinely caught poisoning people and despite frequent arrests for her killings, was always let free. Why is that? Well, the Empire got word and decided they could use her to their advantage. Her first big gig came from Empress Agrippina to kill her husband, Emperor Claudius. Locusta complied with glee and assassinated the Emperor. However, soon after, Agrippina threw her under the bus for the crime. But now, under the ruling of Lord Nero, he saved her for his own devilish plots. For the next 15 years under Nero, she worked consistently and was even awarded for her service. Locusta received a villa and even a small staff to help her in her poisonous endeavors. Nero even went as far to provide her with her own school for the profession. But after Nero was sentenced to death, Locusta lost her security blanket and lawful immunity and was executed by the emperor for her crimes. Coming in at number three is Gilles de Rey. Joan of Arc is rightfully so credited as a certified badass and patron saint who was a major defender of the French during the Hundred Years War. Among her most supportive and trusted allies was Gilles de Rey, an esteemed knight in the French army who was appointed the highest military distinction one could receive at the time. But if he was such a big deal and close companion of Joan, why isn't he as widely celebrated? Well, that's because sadly he was actually super evil. By day he was defending France beside Joan of Arc, but at night he was into the senseless killing of minors in occultist rituals. Often he would lure the unsuspecting victims in with psychological torture, convincing them that it was just a game before bludgeoning them and doing other cruel and unspeakable things to their corpses, supposedly using them for his rituals. Eventually, he was found out and tried for his crimes, admitting to all his vicious acts and hanged as punishment. Although no one knows for sure, it's suspected he had nearly 150 victims. Coming in at number two is virginity tests. Back in a time when a woman was merely the property of her husband, there was one very important thing that needed to be assured before the wedding night that she was pure. Mostly because it was believed that the consummation in fact kind of sealed the whole husband owning his wife deal, and if she had done it with anyone else, she didn't really belong to him. 
charming. So to ensure that their potential wife was worth the dowry, suitors would perform virginity tests on their brides to be to make sure they weren't getting a secondhand woman, if you will. Such tests included inspecting their urine, as it was believed a virgin's urine would be clear. Other times they would give the woman a special potion, and if she could refrain from peeing, she was a virgin, as if a bladder was any indication of that. Sometimes a physician would be hired to inspect the woman's downstairs area, as they believed they could literally just tell by looking at it. Most common though was to inspect the sheets after the marriage was consummated. If there was blood, hooray, a virgin. If not, well then it was assumed she was a liar and her husband was legally entitled to compensation for being swindled into marrying her. And last up today are syphilis zombies. Sometimes it's easy to forget just how much antibiotics have changed the world around us. While nowadays a shot of penicillin can keep an early onset of the STI at bay, back in the day it could quite literally be the end of you. In fact, in 1494, Italy experienced one of the worst outbreaks in history, and if you didn't know any better, you might have thought it was a zombie apocalypse. Of course, before there was any kind of real understanding about how these types of diseases could be spread or caught, people were, let's just say, having a lot of fun with each other. But on the flip side of that, if they caught the infection, it would cause flesh to literally dissolve off their bodies until their inevitable death within a few months. It was also widely believed that bedding a virgin could cure you of the disease, so that's fun. Apparently, it was not uncommon to witness people missing hands, feet, eyes, noses, or look as if they'd been dropped into a vat of acid while walking down the street. Also remember that it took a few months before the disease actually killed them, so they were just living in excruciating pain while their flesh was slowly eaten away, in some cases right down to the bone. With that image in mind, it does make a little bit more sense as to why they believed you would go to hell for premarital relations. Like, I kind of get why they thought it was the devil punishing you for your sins. Thank God for antibiotics. Mm -hmm.